Good morning. Happy Father's Day. We're glad you're here with us today. Let's sing this out. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. Then you came along, you put me back together. Satisfied here in your love. Oh, 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 there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid, no, 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 to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. See, there's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing. Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Come on, church, sing. You turn glory. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the
Well, good morning. My name is Tom Bryan. I have the privilege of serving as an elder here in this uh, congregation. Uh, And happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there, fathers who have been fathers for a while, and some of you who are new fathers. Um, It's an exciting time, and it's a privilege um, that we have to be fathers. Um, As usual, this is our confession time. Um, This is a time when we slow ourselves and prepare our hearts for worship. Um, On this Father's Day, I wanted to read a scripture for us, and then we'll take some time in personal quiet and confession, and then I'll pray, and then we'll confess together. Second Corinthians, Paul is writing the church in Corinth. This is Second Corinthians 6, um, starting in verse 16. For we are the temple of the living God, as God says, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Think about that as you spend some time in personal confession. Lord God, thank you that you're our perfect father. Thank you for adopting us as your sons and daughters. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be in a relationship with you. Lord, humble our hearts. Help us to be teachable. Help us to be um, servants for you, Father. Help us to seek you with contrite hearts. Let's confess together. O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Forgive us, Lord, for the ways we have corrupted your good creation. Gracious Lord, you alone are righteous and holy, and in your presence no one can stand. Your gracious mercy is our only hope, and we ask for your forgiveness. Thank you for your cleansing touch that has washed away our corruption. Thank you for clothing us in righteousness, and that your hand is reworking our lives anew. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.
quickly, I want to just share something with you. Um, Sarah and I have been talking a lot about p- physical posture in service, in worship, um, and, and Tom as well. And uh, we, we had a leadership meeting this week where we discussed personality types and things like that. And it occurred to me, I don't know why, for the first time, probably not for the first time, but it occurred to me, everybody worships differently. Amen? Amen. I'm, I'm a fairly expressive person. Out of the two of us, I'm the crier, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know the last time I saw her cry. I cried yesterday. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. We really want Cap City to be a place where we all engage the Lord however he's drawn us to do that. Okay? So it's easy for me as a leader to be like, stand up and sing with us because that's what I would do. Right? But that might not be your posture towards the Lord in that moment. And I just want to encourage you that, that whatever God draws you, however he draws you to worship him. Do that. Even if everybody else around you isn't doing that, right? If he draws you to kneel before him, if he draws you to sit, if he draws you to stand, if he draws you to dance, if he draws, I mean, whatever, I know, watch out. (laughs) Whatever, however he draws you is what we want to have happen here, okay? And so I just want to, I want to just give you that freedom and give you that uh, ability to just hear how God is calling you and drawing, drawing you. Let's sing this out together. power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son or daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with? 
with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings come on lift it up this is amazing grace this is unfailing your voice and sing it out. Amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. Through all my fears are gone. I'm no longer. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Uh, this morning's scripture comes from Galatians chapter 3. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now the fa that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have been put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are all Christ, then you are all Adam's offspring, according to promise.
from my mother's room from my mother's room you have chosen me love has called my name i've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins i'm no longer I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I Declare this together. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Our Father God, that's our declaration today, God, that you have made us unafraid. God, we are not slaves to the fear that's around us. God, we are your children through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray this morning, God, that you would just speak to us. God, that you would draw us to yourself. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear your great goodness. We love you, Father, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would just stay standing for a minute. Good morning. morning. First things first, I'm a crier too. (laughs) And if anybody's dancing in this congregation, I think Tim Schultz is likely the first candidate. (laughs) I love you. I'm going to read just a quick passage that all of you have heard before. We're going to get there eventually out of Matthew chapter 11. Give me one second.
Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you, you will find rest for your souls. You can be seated. Now that's not a good start, me tearing up. <laughs> Golly, I swear, I think the Lord did it to humble me. I don't mind it now, but uh, hey, happy Father's Day. Um, happy Father's Day to you. We are blessed in this congregation to have some excellent men, some excellent fathers. Um, however, in the times that I've ever spoken, and it's a day where you wish a happy Father's Day or a happy Mother's Day, there's the other side of the coin as well. You know, not everybody has experienced uh, a great father, or maybe fathers, you might be carrying a burden of having made some mistakes that uh, you've, you've had, you've burdened, you've carried that burden for quite some time. Um, I want to encourage you, uh, from my own personal experience, I want to encourage you that our Father in Heaven heals all wounds. He restores hope and joy, and no matter your experience, your Father in Heaven is ready to forgive all those who humble themselves before Him. Father's Day is a great pretext to our, com- to our talk today about Sabbath. As I've shared before, I, I've spoken once before, but uh, during confession and welcome, I oftentimes refer to shadows. Uh, maybe you've heard that. If you've never heard that, that's okay. Let me explain myself. I believe that this world is filled with shadows of God's heart for you and me. Now, a shadow, as you know, if you're around the corner of a building and I'm coming and the sun is shining just right, you will see the shadow of what is to be standing in your face in just a moment. And so it is with creation. And I think that fatherhood is intended to be a shadow of selfless strength, and protection that provides rest for our wives and children, a reflection of God the Father's Sabbath stance towards you and me. That's what fatherhood is. Now before we pray, I'd like you to place a finger in Genesis 1 and Matthew chapter 11. So those of you with a paper Bible, if you do that, that'll help you to be well suited to follow along. And I'm gonna take a chance. I usually don't go off script much anymore because I say something I shouldn't. However, I wanna challenge those of you that have an electric Bible, electronic Bible, and rely on it significantly. Now, I don't wanna embarrass you, so don't shove it away and kinda act like you forgot your paper Bible. However, um, when I was, I think I was 22 or 23, I realized that I had a Ryrie study Bible, New American Standard, from my grandpa. And I was down in Dallas studying my Bible, and wouldn't you know it, the pastor that was teaching me used a New American Standard. Now, I was new in my faith. All I'd used is NIV. I, the, the, the translations didn't mean anything to me, but the notes from my grandfather in that Bible meant a lot. I want you to be careful, those of you that rely on your phone too much, Think real quickly about what you might be foregoing leaving to the next generation. The notes of your experience with the Father can't be held. Well, they can. You certainly can print off the documents and put them in your folder with your will. However, I think that a paper Bible, it might be well suited to encourage the next generations as you keep notes of your experience, spending time reading the Word of God and hearing sermons and so on and so forth. So I want to challenge you with that. I don't, please don't hear me wrong. I think cell phones, go ahead, use them. But don't, don't uh, be mindless. Don't forget of what you might be foregoing to your sons and daughters, your grandsons and daughters. That paper Bible still has significant uh, power to influence the next generations. Now let's pray. Father in heaven, my prayer is for your inspiration in my heart and mind, and those of all listening today. We humble ourselves before you, our sovereign Father who loves us so very much and takes great pride and joy in his children. Illuminate and inspire our minds and hearts with the weighty truths of the gospel 
and stir joy in our hearts. Bless this congregation with great rest from the world. Engage them with the truth of Sabbath rest and anchor it in the soul of each of us in this church. For the joy of your people and your glory. Glorify yourself now, I pray. Amen. Now I've shared a little bit about a previous evangelist, Brennan Manning, that played a significant role in my life when I was young in my faith. Great books that I would challenge you on the love of the Father to go ahead and get and read. They're excellent. Today I want to talk about another pastor that influenced my life when I was younger in my faith, and even still today. His name is John Piper. Some of you have heard of him. John Piper was a pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota from 1980 to 2013. His messages and works have influenced my life greatly. When I was a new believer and I resonate tremendously with his depth and love for scripture and his belief that there is a distinct connection between our satisfaction and joy in Christ and God's glory. If you've never read any of his works, I would encourage you to look them up today and order yourself a book or two. The satisfaction, our satisfaction in God produces his glory. That was John Piper's premise. I believe that you've got two options in this world, to head in the direction of satisfaction in the things of the world and putting yourself in environments, i.e. social media or TV commercials that are gonna try to stir as much dissatisfaction in your current circumstances <laughs> to make you do something to fix it, or you can run to the Father and rest in Him, and He will break you of those things and show you when you're entering into the danger zone, and He will give you rest for your soul and great joy that is incomparable to the things of this world. And by that, you will bring Him more glory. Brothers and sisters, I believe God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied and at rest in him. God has created and commanded Sabbath to provide the satisfaction and rest that we crave. I want to begin with day one in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter one, verse three. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now, we do not read at this time of creation that God had yet created sleep or rest. However, this pattern of night and day remains throughout the six days of creation and to this day. And mankind has taken the darkness to be a time of rest. But why did God do this? He will one day have us in his presence, presence of eternal light, no darkness in his presence. He could have done it in the beginning, but I want to submit to you that rest, and more specifically rest in him, may likely have been on his mind and a design of the human being that he had in mind as he put you and me together. Aside from rest, I want you to look at day three and the idea of joy. Now, I can't explain why he doesn't say it was good in day one or two, and we'd likely be making a mistake to look too deeply into it. However, beginning on day three, we see God reflecting and commenting on the goodness of creation. Genesis 1, verse 11, and God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. And the earth was brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. We see the Father commenting on the goodness of creation each day forward. It is something that he is taking joy in. And then he stops. Genesis chapter 2. The heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested 
on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And so God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. This is God's marked experience of Sabbath. He is enjoying his work. He is fully engaged in joyful resting. Now, I believe that you and me, you and, you and I, rather, have been raised in a Christianity influenced largely by capitalism. Before I go too far down that road, I want you to know that I actually enjoy capitalism. I'm an entrepreneur, so capitalism, driven by honesty and integrity, is really fun for me. And I don't believe it's inherently evil. However, its influence on the Christian faith has its faults. As Americans, we often begin with work first. We begin with strategy and development and not necessarily with an abiding satisfaction and peace in him that drives us joyfully. Instead, we often tag him to the end of our work. Or, if we get in a pickle, we cry out and insert him in the middle. You've likely done this, I have too. But in this country, we can be an insecure people who substitute an opportunity to experience the presence of God with the sensation we get from being productive. Let me say that one more time. In this country specifically, now I haven't traveled as much as Pastor Tim. I know he's seen a lot of different cultures, but in this country specifically, we can be an insecure people. Insecure, seeking satisfaction that's not stable and long-lasting. Who substitute an opportunity to experience the presence of God with the sensation we get from being productive. Our God is a God of joyful rest. And he wants that for you. He wants that for me. And we see throughout the first few books of the Bible that God provides rest graciously to those who did not deserve it. Genesis 3.21, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. We see here God giving rest to the embarrassed shame of Adam and Eve when they're naked after turning from him. He didn't have to do that. Let me remind you, I think you know that. He could have judged them and harshly turned his back. Instead, with tenderness, like a good father. He takes an innocent animal. He kills it, another shadow of a coming Christ one day, an innocent one who would provide coverings for your sin and my sin. And he provides covering to the naked shame of Adam and Eve. And likely a tad bit of rest for their souls at that time. Genesis 7, verse 16, And those that had entered, male and female of all flesh, went in, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut them in. This is Noah, and Noah filling the ark before the storm hits. And I want you to pay attention to the last sentence. It could have read just as easily, and Noah pulled on the cord that he had created and shut the door, but it does not. It reads, and the Lord shut him in. Can you imagine, just imagine with me, if you're in that boat at that time and this door shuts and you know it's God that shut you in, how much strength and confidence would you feel at that point in time? I, I dare say that that was a form of rest from the storm that was about to hit. God shutting them in, protecting them. And then finally, the one that I wanted to share with you is rest from slavery to Egypt. I want to read to you a worship song created by Moses after the experience of leaving Egypt and after the parting of the Red Sea and when it came back in on the military of Egypt. Moses writes this in Exodus chapter 15. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he is thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. 
The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And later on in that song, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. This satisfied soul of Moses' drives true worship. And I think that's the ultimate goal of God in Sabbath, giving you rest and satisfaction in him that turns into light to delight and joy in your father. A satisfied soul drives sincere worship. Now later on in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 31, verse 12, it writes, Above all you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. God is rest, and he is the source behind, behind all that you do in this life for good. And he creates Sabbath and tells Moses here for you to be still and to purge yourself from the belief that it's you and stir worship for the one alone who sanctifies you and me. Brothers and sisters, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied and at rest in him. God has created and commanded Sabbath to provide the satisfaction and peace that we crave. Now I'm going to turn to the New Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. And we believers are to begin everything with him. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Don't think that I have come to abolish the law and prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to be the fulfillment of the laws given to Moses. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. And I believe that God has designed us to set aside time daily, weekly, monthly and annually, and so on, in order to seek and experience his presence and be satisfied in him. But Christ, he is the beginning of our ultimate rest in eternity. And your experience of his presence is a slight glimpse into eternity where there will be no darkness, but only light coming from the, not from the Son, but from the presence of the Father. And as a result of that, joy-driven worship will fill the kingdom of heaven, your voices and my voice, for the rest of eternity. We'll need a few bottles of water, I would anticipate. I imagine our throats will get a little bit dry. But the eternity will be filled with our joyful praises, rooted in deep satisfaction in the Father when we're in his presence for eternity. The final eternal blood-bought Sabbath rest is found in Christ. Christ has become our Sabbath rest. We come to Christ for soul rest. There is no rest anywhere else but in Christ, ultimately. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, For you have been saved by grace through faith, and this is not your own doing, but the grace of God, so that no man can boast. If God is done achieving your salvation, don't add anything to it. Abandon all personal works for eternal salvation. Abandon your works and let him become your everlasting Sabbath. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to look at a story where John the Baptist has been imprisoned. Now, John the Baptist came as a precursor preaching of the king of kings that would come and introduce the kingdom of heaven. He stood for his faith like many of you, like myself, try to do every day. But he got thrown into prison. And inevitably, he probably saw the writing on the wall that he was about to get killed. And this is what he writes in Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? 
And Jesus answered the disciples, said, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised and the poor have good news preached to them. Now John was expecting a warrior king to come and to establish the nation of Israel again in a significant and powerful way. But Jesus instead begins by providing healing and rest for the broken. This is what his kingdom is established on. I love the first song that we sang this morning. It speaks of the upside down nature of the kingdom of heaven, that he turns graves into gardens. This is the type of kingdom that Christ has. And I wonder, As John faced death, if the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, came upon him in the jail cell, as his disciples shared of the miraculous work that Jesus, the Son of God, had done. His kingdom is completely different. It's completely upside down thinking. He believes, I I think, that you're more productive when you rest in him. When you go to the back of the line, when you're last, he makes you first. Completely upside down thinking. And unless you find rest in him, you may not have eyes to see that. Because his Holy Spirit is the one that empowers you to do so. Let's look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom of children. Christ is a safe place for the one who does not believe he is a God also. The humble and innocent-minded are to come and find rest. The kingdom of heaven is upside-down thinking to the world, And while many may work harder, the Lord asks you to rest in his presence. And he'll give you eyes to see those eternal things that others cannot. Later on in chapter 11, he says, Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. And then he says this, listen really closely. Come to me, all who weary, who, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now speaking to a group of Jews who had been burdened by spiritual leaders of the day with work and effort uh, to appeal to God, Jesus is asking them instead, stop that work and now find rest here. I am your rest. I am your Sabbath. Jesus is urging those listening to him to lay down their works, their weapons, their drive and fight and rest. Do not fear, but rest from your striving. Rest in God's upside down kingdom. Now you will strive, you will achieve, but by Sabbath rest in him you will do these things. And by this you will have great joy and in turn glorify God. Now, a brief warning. If you do not set aside time and find your satisfaction and rest in Him, it's likely going to be forced upon you by the breaking down of your mind, body, spirit, relationships, and influence. Let me say that again. If you do not set aside time and find your satisfaction and rest in him, it's likely going to be forced upon you by the breaking down of your mind, body, spirit, relationships, and influence. I've experienced this. When I was in seminary, 
uh, I went to graduate school in Dallas for a time. And I've shared this before, but I had no idea I was seeking significance, trying to be like other people. I was looking left and right. I was over here, even though I was in a Christian environment, I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. And God broke me. I fell into a really dark depression. But it was one of the best things that ever happened in my life. He took insecurity and grounded me in a comfort and security in who I am in him. But only by the strength of the Holy Spirit. I had a pastor that is still a, uh, someone I look up to, to, to today. Some of you might be familiar with his, his teaching, Tommy Nelson. Tommy Nelson is a pastor of a Bible church in Denton, Texas, and it's why I originally moved to Texas. Tommy is a, a great teacher, someone that tons of folks look up to and appreciate how God has blessed him to be able to exegetically teach the Bible and make it make sense. But ironically enough, about the time I was in seminary in early 2000s, he fell into a dark place too. He was in the back of the of the sanctuary one day waiting to be called out on stage to preach and he thought he was having a heart attack. Well, after a couple years of trying to figure out what was wrong with him physically, he started to connect the dots and realized that he was just physically, emotionally, spiritually bankrupt. He was going way too hard, way too fast. And God broke this 55, 60 year old man. In an ironic way, it was encouraging to me because I'm this 22 year old, ignorant, you know, seminary student, and then I look at this 55, 60 year old godly man that I looked up to, and he's preaching at chapel at Dallas Theological Seminary, talking about how you need to find rest in the Father, and you need to have uh, healthy rhythms in life, and you need to pull aside, and you need to be careful what you place your significance in, and find rest and drive from God alone, and not your own personal pride and ambition. If you don't set aside time and find your satisfaction and rest in him, it likely will be forced upon you. But instead of it being forced upon you, I want to encourage you to rest. Capital City Church, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied and in, at rest in him. God has created and commanded Sabbath to provide satisfaction that we crave and restoring the reality that all of this is his work alone. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath, and we as believers are to begin everything by resting in him. Now, ironic that I'm giving a message on Sabbath rest, and then I'm going to give you some to-dos. They're easy. Hopefully, they're very light. But I believe you, just like me, you're a work in progress, no matter how old or young you are. And you're inching towards this lifestyle and returning to it when we fail, often. And as a side note, hopefully not beating yourself up. I don't think that is something God would intend for you. There's no rest in beating yourself up. But rest is God's desire for you, and it's why we have scripture, it's why we have brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's why we have a gracious and patient Father in heaven. This morning I was at Starbucks and a couple of the men in our church were meeting there this morning. Uh, and that is one of the ways that you learn some of these principles by looking up to older men and women of the faith and asking them how they do this. How do you find rest in God? What does it look like for you? Now, I'm a little less balanced in this message this week because I don't just want you to incorporate rest into your life. I want you to run to it first. I want you to run to it often. And I want it to drive you. Now, beginning with something regular, a regular time that you give yourself daily to be with God. As a father looks upon his child, those with a sincere heart desiring his Sabbath rest and presence, he will bless you. Don't worry about how much time you set aside, even if it's five minutes. Regular time, daily and weekly, to give yourself to be with God. Now, I want to encourage you, do nothing during this time. Do not surf the internet. Do not drive your car. 
but set it aside. Do not do. Just be. The best thing in the universe is to be in Christ, to be in union with Christ. If you grasp spiritual Sabbath, abiding in Christ, you will experience no greater thing this side of eternity. And one additional thing, let your prayer be simple and consistent. Lord, teach me to Sabbath. Lord, teach me to Sabbath. Lord, teach me to Sabbath. My hope from this message is that three months from now, some of you are still praying that prayer. Consistently, faithfully, simply, before a God who loves you. And he'll bless you. He will. Now I want to finish with Revelation chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues, and he spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the church, the wife of the Lamb, Jesus. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Verse 22, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has... The city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb, Jesus Christ. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night. We will be in his presence continually, satisfied in his presence and at rest forever. And that will be a good day. Let's pray. Lord, teach us to Sabbath. Teach us to rest in you. I pray for a body of Christ that is driven by being fully satisfied and filled with great joy in your presence among us. And you have blessed us with your presence, but oh, there is so very much more of you. Make us the kind of body that can handle you revealing more of yourself to us. Bless us with your presence. Do with us what you will. Your presence is of more value to us than gold or silver. Bless us with the spirit that believes. We love you, Christ. We thank you for laying down your life. Increase our satisfaction and joy in you for your glory. Amen.
Thank you guys again for being here today. You can go ahead and be seated. I'm going to just make a couple mention of a few things. Um, for those of you that are new with us today or maybe have been just kicking the tires on Capital City Church, two of the best ways that you can feel like you belong, uh, which is likely something that is a desire of yourself, yours if you stick here long enough. I hope it is a desire of yours. Uh, small groups and serving. If you have any questions around those things, you're wondering what in the world is a small group, or if you do know what that is and you want to be a part of one and see how we structure those things, Pastor Aaron will be back over here at the end of service. Also, I want to encourage you, we have been saving money for uh, Lifeline Ministries, and Marianne, Marianne Curry will be back. Well, I don't know that she will be back. I hadn't talked to her yet, but where is she? I know she's, there you are. Yes, can I put you on the spot? You have any questions? She's right there. If you have been saving money, there's a ton of money back on that back table. Do not take it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's for that ministry. Our benediction today comes out of Ephesians 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you to be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. We're going to finish with one more song, and Eric will dismiss us.
Thank you for being here today. You are dismissed.